In just a second, a couple of our young men are going to pass down the aisles. These are for fellowship meals, funeral meals, uh, sign-up sheets. And so if you would be willing to uh, help with a funeral meal or a fellowship meal during this year, guys, if you'll go ahead and get started, just raise your hand and they will get one of these to you. And you can lay those in the box on a table left of the water fountain when you leave today. So these are for fellowship meals, funeral meals. We have a men's event coming up at the end of this month, a men's uh, day. And I'm excited about this. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we have a guest speaker coming uh, from Broken Arrow. The minister or preacher of Broken Arrow, Tim Piles, will come and give us a couple good lessons on uh, going the distance. And so this is about as guys uh, persevering. It's about continuing in the faith and continuing strong and being on fire for God. Uh, I want you to know we're, in, we're welcoming the uh, young men, teen boys would be welcome to come to this event for our men's day. And so want to make sure that you're aware of that. And then um, it, it, we're going to have Tim Piles there. And then we're also going to start off the morning with a big... M.A. Breakfast. And if you don't know what M.A. Breakfast stands for, that's a big Matt Aldridge Breakfast. And guys, if you've not been to one of those, you're going to want to. So we're, we're wanting to get uh, 40 men to come to this Men's Day uh, the last Saturday of this month. So be thinking and praying about that. Our theme this year is Radical Living. And we have four subtopics uh, on this theme, Radical Living. And so if you were not here last week, basically the idea of this is um, it's not, we're not talking about radical in the sense of uh, too far to an extreme. We're talking about radical in the sense of being all in. We're not, we're not after lukewarm living. We're not, God's not after lukewarm Christians. And so we're talking about being on fire for God. And uh, so you may have friends in the world that would call that radical, but God calls it faithful. And so, radical living. And, the, and one of those subtopics, the first one we will focus on this quarter, is the topic of love. So, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10 and verse 25, we're going to take a look at a, a story Jesus told about radical love. Luke 10, 25, Scripture says a, a lawyer. Now, in the first century in, this, in the Jewish nation, a lawyer was a... Uh, we would think of a minister, a preacher, but basically this was, he was a lawyer in the sense that he studied the old law, the law of Moses. And so uh, these men were very knowledgeable in the word of God. So a, a lawyer came, put him to, uh, stood up to put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? That's what Jesus said. What is written in the law? How do you read it? Jesus answer to this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Because this man is, he's testing Jesus, but he's also, this is kind of a normal discourse in a, a class setting in the first century. He's asking the rabbi, what must I do to inher inherit eternal life? And, and the rabbi comes back and says, what does the word of God say? I think that's important because you think about this, Jesus of all people, Jesus could have answered directly. Jesus could have said, I'll tell you exactly what you must do. But even Jesus Christ didn't say what he must do. He said, he asked the man, what does the word of God say? And it's a reminder for us. This is our guide, the word of God. And we're living in a day and time, our culture, our modern culture says there are many truths. The modern culture talks about what's your truth, my truth. What do you think? What do I think? And so I would caution you and remind you. Sometimes we, we, you may have inadvertently said something like this. Sometimes we'll make a, a statement that's foolish and not know it. And we'll say, well, I, you know, the, the God I believe in, I just think God, fill in the blank. Okay? I think God accepts or wants or desires or whatever. Fill in the blank. And anytime you hear someone say, well, I, I just think God, whatever comes in that blank, if they don't, have book, chapter, verse, or if they're not quoting the Word of God, be careful. Be careful. And anytime, if we justify any of our actions by thinking, well, I just don't think God would, would be upset, or I, I just don't think God minds, what did Jesus say? 
He said, go look it up. What does the word of God say? That's our guide. So, verse 27, the lawyer, he answers. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So this, this uh, religious leader, he knows the word of God, and he actually quotes from two different places. It almost sounds like that's one quote. He's quoting from Deut Deuteronomy 6.5. And Leviticus 19.18, two different places. And it is said that in the first century, a, a, a faithful religious Jew would quote the first one about love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. They would quote that aloud twice a day religiously. Pretty good practice to quote it. But it's one thing to know it. It's another thing to do it, right? And, and one message from this, and Jesus will tell him, you're correct. And the basic message here is love God, love your neighbor. <clears throat> A lot of times we, um, we find it easier to love God than we do to love our neighbor. Uh, and I, I would uh, use as an illustration the dynamic in a step family. Step families are uniquely difficult. They're challenging. Uh, they're challenging in ways that is different from a, a um, technical term as nuclear family, uh, normal family. I hate to use the word normal, but it, so if you have a family, mom, dad, and the child biologically belongs to both, of course, that's, God, that's God's wonderful design. But a step family is challenging. And usually in a step family, the, the uh, health of the family in other words, the indicator of how, how will that family do, how well will they do, usually it's one relationship in particular. Let's say there's one child. And so uh, Mary has a child and she uh, is re uh, remarrying Jim. However, the stepdad and the stepchild do. That relationship pretty well tells you how the whole family is going to do. Now, why is it? That the step parent and the step child, why is it that they could not, uh, let's say, have a lot of conflict and the and the husband and wife be okay? And the answer is, for the wife, she would say, "You love me, that's good, but you can't hate my child and love me and us be good." Does that make sense? And so we see that, and we we uh, many of you in here, uh, including me, we experience a step family. It's challenging. So I say all that to say, we cannot say, God, I'm good with you. I'm just not good with your kids. I'm not good with other people. God, I love you. I love you. I love animals. I don't like people. <laughs> Granted, people can be difficult to love, right? That's why we have the word radical, because it's not easy. And so God says, if you want to be good with me, you have to love your neighbor. Yeah. So Jesus said, you've answered correctly. <laughs> And verse 29, the man desiring to justify himself, like uh, we often do, the man says, well, who's my neighbor? Now, I've read that in the first century, the Jews, Jewish teachers would teach that neighbor meant your fellow Jew. So just kind of file that back. This lawyer asking this question, he may have thought, well, who's my neighbor, Jesus? And the common thought of that day was probably to a Jew that their neighbor was their fellow Israelite, fellow Jew. So Jesus tells a story about a man. He's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And on that <clears throat> travel, which incidentally, that road from Jerusalem to Jericho, uh, 17 miles roughly. But it's a lot of hills, uh, a lot of cliffs, notoriously dangerous because of the terrain made it easy for bandits and robbers to hide and then attack an unsuspecting traveler. And so Jesus tells a story about a man who traveled that road and he was uh, among robbers. He was stripped of his clothes. He was beaten and they left him half dead. Uh, he's probably bleeding. He was bleeding. He is without clothing. He is probably unconscious. And so verse 31, Jesus says, 
by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, pass by on the other side. So a priest would have, going that road down to Jericho, would have probably been serving at the temple and going away from the temple. Um, it, Pharisees in the first century believed, of course, excuse me, for a Jew to touch a dead body would make them unclean. <clears throat> and being unclean, they would be unable to worship for a number of days. So a Pharisee, it is said that a Pharisee was so strict about that law that they believed if even their shadow fell on a corpse, that it would make them unclean. And so maybe the priest is going on the other side, not for his safety, but to make sure he does not touch something that's unclean. Maybe he thinks the man's dead. Maybe he thinks the man might be dead. But he doesn't help. He goes on the other side. Verse 32, a Levite. He comes. So a priest would be a Levite. A priest had to be a Levite. And then, so you have the priest first. That would be the one who would assist in sacrifices. A Levite would be one who, he's not a priest, but he does help with the temple, temple duties. So he would be a servant uh, or someone who would likely serve with temple duties and assist with those. And so he does the same thing. Maybe he's worried about being defiled and un unable to worship, but he goes by on the other side. And then verse 33 he says, but a Samaritan. And of course, Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Uh, Samaritans came out of the northern tribe from the northern captivity when that, when that uh, I say northern tribe, the, the northern part of uh, the nation, when they split, the Samaritans, when they were in captivity, they intermarried. So coming out of captivity, they continued to worship God, but they, had, they were considered mixed uh, race and less pure. So there was a lot of conflict between the Jews of the south and the Samaritans north, and they despised each other, So, but a Samaritan. <clears throat> As he journeyed, came to where he was, when he saw him, he had compassion. Compassion is a key word. Uh, when we talk about loving the unlovable, when we talk about loving people who are difficult to love, compassion is a key part of that. And usually if we are not loving to someone who we don't like, we're not loving to someone who is, um, they're not treating us right, normally compassion is the last thing on our mind. We view them as a... Uh, bully, we view, view them as uh, someone who's done wrong, and we uh, and so compassion is something just to file back. If if you want to love someone who's hard to love, find a way to have compassion for them. And oftentimes, the meanest people on this planet um, have a lot of pain in their life. So, verse thirty-four, he went to him. Look what he did. He he binds up his wounds. He pours oil and wine on them. Uh, oil would have been used medicinally and wine as a disinfectant. So he binds the wounds. He treats the wounds as you could in the first century. Puts him on his own animal. So this man was traveling. The Samaritan had an animal he was traveling on, which would make that rocky journey a lot easier. He gets off his animal. He puts the, the injured man on his own animal. And takes him to an inn, takes him to a hotel, and has him taken care of. When you love someone, you're willing to take what is yours and let them use it. Let them have it. Let them benefit from it. It's a different... You know, as Christians, I remind you that we really don't have things anymore. Because when we submitted our lives to Christ... We submitted all of it. And we still get to use it. You have a home that you go and live in, but is it, if I'm a Christian, is it really my home or is it God's home? Is it really my car or is it God's car? And this Samaritan, he was not, he didn't hesitate to put this man on his animal uh, to take him to this inn. Verse 35, the next day he took out two denarii. Gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. He loved this man with action. 
And he didn't do it halfway. He didn't say, you know what, I, 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 I mean, here, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll bind you up a little bit, and I'm pretty sure there's going to be some more people coming. Somebody else can probably take you into town. But this story that Jesus tells of this Samaritan, he loves fully. So verse 36, Jesus goes back to <clears throat> this lawyer. Now remember, um, incidentally, it's also said in the first century with Jews and Samaritans, they wouldn't even buy each other's oil. Oil was a major commodity in the first century. It was very valuable and useful, and they would refuse to even use you know, the other's product. So this Samaritan binds up this uh, Jew and treats his wounds... Anyway, the whole story to a good Jew in the first century, this story is upside down, first of all. Samaritans don't help Jews. If, a, if somebody's going to help somebody, it'd be a Jew helping a Samaritan, first of all. Um, second of all, everything about this would hit at the core of their prejudice. But the Samaritan loved this man with action. And Jesus says, which of the three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed mercy. Jesus told him to go and do likewise. We have a great passage from Luke 6. Uh, if you'll turn there, Luke 6, 32. You talk about a... This is a convicting passage. Uh, because it, rem, it, it reminds us, sometimes we think we're doing pretty well with love. You know, do you love people? We would say yes. If I said, show of hands, who loves your neighbor? We'd raise all our hands up. Right? Um... Do you treat people in a loving, kind way? Oh, yeah. Hands go up, right? Jesus said, If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. Kind of, that kind of strikes deep, doesn't it? You know, if you're doing good to people you like, you can call yourself a human. I mean, that's what humans do. Re really, that doesn't really, that didn't really, doesn't really put us any closer to God's holiness. The fact that we love people who are easy to love. He says, but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. We call this radical love for a reason, right? <clears throat> Expect nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. You ever try to help someone who's ungrateful? That's not easy. You ever help someone who is ungrateful? That kind of hurts. It kind of hurts. It's frustrating. It's irritating. Um, Jesus and God are kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Some translations say wicked. So, and, and before I get into this uh, next illustration, I'll, I'll just mention that uh, with the recent shooting in, in Texas at a church, and there was one a year or two ago in Tennessee, you know, some of these events... They get our attention because prior to that time, we don't think of these things happening. But when they happen, we all think of them happening. And so I remind you, church, your shepherds are uh, they're coordinating with uh, Jerry Don and uh, making plans and preparations and basically thinking through, church, what could we do to be more secure, more safe? There's a note in the bulletin about in the future we will be... <laughs> Uh, at 10 till 11, we'll be locking the north doors, the south doors, just to make us a little more secure. So when people, if someone were to come in late, they come in doors, we can see better. So we'll, we will protect ourselves as we're lawfully able to do. Okay? With that said, imagine a scenario, a man comes in um, intending to do us harm. He has a weapon, but he is... Uh, engaged before he's able to use that weapon, before he's able to um, do any harm, and an intervention is made, and police are called, and he's arrested. Make sense? So maybe a, a, 
a, a, quiet, a semi-quiet uh, engagement, but nothing like what happened in Texas. So the man is arrested. Some would want to find the name of this man and look him up on social media and drag, drag his name through the mud. And maybe many of us would consider not only what he planned to do as evil, we might consider him evil. My question is, who would want to go on the next night, Monday night for the Master, who would want to go down to David L. Moss and sit across from a secure window and talk to a man about a savior who wants to save his soul. Who wants to go do that? How many of us would, let's say, gather on a Monday night and we're going to pray for that man? Because normal love hates those who hate them, right? Normal love you love your friends, you hate your enemies. That's normal love. That's human love. Radical love. You say, preacher, I don't know. I think you're going a little far here. With, you know, somebody's coming in to do us harm. I think not only we stop them, but, but I don't think we need to pray for them. They, they, that, per, that person's evil. That person's gone. And I would, I would ask you, who did Jesus die for? He died for all. And on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't, know what they, they don't know what they do. And we would say that about someone who is so... They might be mentally ill, granted. But they're so close to Satan that they're doing wicked, evil things. We don't like anything about what they're trying to do. And we would stop them with all of our ability. My point is, can we love like Jesus loved? So look at this. Remember, uh, I'll bring your minds to this uh, night. Remember when Jesus was crucified, the night before, the evening before, he washes his apostles' feet. Washing the feet is strange. Now, first of all, we don't wash each other's feet, so automatically we're kind of, we're having to understand a different culture. So imagine with me, I try to, I try to think of something that's something we could relate to. Imagine with me that we had a guest preacher come in and preach, and, and we've got a big name, okay, a big name in the brotherhood, not, not, not that he would not be humble, but I'm just saying that, let, and I was trying to think of a big name, so um, Phil Robertson, many of you know the name Phil Robertson with uh, the show Duck Dynasty, Duck Commander out of Louisiana. So let's say we brought in, uh, and before I even heard of this man's name, I had one of our members who hunts a lot, he was telling me about him, I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. He said, Elliot, if you had him come, you couldn't get everyone in the building who would come and listen to this man. I said, I don't... I, I don't think you know what you're talking about. But anyway, he did. So let's say we had someone like that come as a guest preacher. And, uh, and so we would be anxious to hear, um, you know, powerful preaching from the Word of God. Let's say the day before he's here and he goes to Bob's house. And he does the same with all three of our elders. He goes to Bob's house, Curtis's house. He goes to Tom's house. He has a laundry hamper at their doorstep. He says, Bob, I need your dirty laundry. And Bob says, Phil, we, we got you lined up to preach tomorrow, and clearly something's not right here. We, you know, we may, I may need to call and get us a backup preacher, but, you know, he, Phil says, no, I need your dirty laundry. I'm going to the laundromat, and I'm going to wash your laundry. And he does that at Tom's house. He does that at Curtis's house. Imagine him doing it at your house. You say, no, you're not touching my dirty laundry, okay? I mean, I've had people come and mow my yard for me. I've had people come and help me out, do this or that, right? You're not, you're not going to do my, right? That's kind of gross, and I'll take care of that. And, but Phil says, I'm going to do it. And he does it. He goes to the laundromat. He washes it. He dries it. He folds it. He takes it back to them. And he tells them that's how we're to love. That's. That helps me a little bit to understand Jesus when he's washing his, these apostles' feet. He washes them all, including Judas, who he knows is about to betray him with a kiss of all things. He washed them all. He didn't wash Judas' feet different either because they didn't know who was going to betray him. He washed Judas' feet just like he washed Peter's feet. 
Radical love. What does radical love mean? It means loving people more than they deserve. Right? That's what it means. Love someone more than they deserve. You say, preacher, if, if somebody comes in trying to hurt me and they get in jail, good. And if you're going to go visit them, whatever. Don't ask me to. And I would say, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Jesus tells his apostles after he washed their feet, he tells them this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples. If you have love for one another. Did Jesus love his enemies? Yes. yes. He washed their feet. This community will know that we are of God if we have radical love. Do you have somebody in your life that you have hard feelings toward? Pray for them. Forgive them. Pray for them until you do forgive them. Do you have, do you have a rude co-worker? Compliment them. Do you have a, a, a mean boss? Honor them. Do you ever meet a stranger? Treat them like a friend. Jesus was a friend to sinners, and may we also be. Not to condone sin, but to connect to sinners who need a Savior. That's radical love. We're going to close with a song about love for each other. Bind us together. And uh, I would remind you that this is God's will for us, that we would love each other so much. And we love outsiders too. But when they, can't, when they come to us, may they see, hey, these people love, they love like crazy. May that be what they see. If you're here this morning and you have a need, we would love for you to come. Uh, we'd love to stop and pray for you. If there's someone here who's not given their life to Christ, we would love to see a, a soul be born again into Christ. If there's something you need, please come while we stand and sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together.